Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to be talking about this simulation that you see here right on screen. It's a gravity simulation, so there's going to be quite a lot of bits and pieces that we need to talk about. In this video, I'm not going to go over any of the code, I'm going to reference it at points, but I'm mostly going to be talking about the theory and the algorithms behind it. As you can see, um, it's pretty cool. We can shoot stuff at stuff, make stuff explode, and uh, make all sorts of cool, pretty pictures. So, the core focus of this video gravity simulation. So first of all, we have to know actually what gravity is. Let's say we have two objects, one has a mass of m1, the other has a mass of m2. Let's say these are both in kilograms, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, they're going to have a gravitational force between them. By the way, uh, from Newton's third law, this force is going to be equal and opposite, so we only have to do one computation for them. The number is going to be the same, it's just going to be in different directions. So the gravitational attraction between them, we're going to write this as Fg. Fg equals g times m1 times m2. Also, we need a distance between them, between their center of mass. Let's say that's r. g times m1 times m2 over r squared. This means that the force of gravity uh, between them exerted on each other is going to be g, which is the universal gravitational constant, times the mass of the first object times the mass of the second object all over their distance squared. Now, g is a bit of a weird number. It is equal to 6.7 times 10 to the negative 11 meters cubed per kilogram second squared, which is a really odd unit, uh, but it's just the way things work in our universe. I don't really know. Go ask some um, physicist or something. By the way, uh, this number is the reason that gravity is such a weak force. We, th it's why we don't all collapse into black holes immediately. It's relatively much weaker than magnetism, electromagnetism, uh, the strong force and the weak force, you know, all those good fundamental forces. Gravity is the weakest out of them. I would also like to note that this over r squared is the inverse square law of gravity. There's a lot of other inverse square laws, but this basically means that gravity, uh, given constant masses, is proportional to 1 over distance squared. So we have our equation for the gravity between, the force of gravity between any two objects in space. Now here's where the trouble comes in. Let's say we have 2,000 points right here, uh, or actually let's make it 1,000 to make it a bit simpler because powers of 10 are nice. Let's say we have 1,000 points. Every frame we're going to need to apply a force or rather an acceleration to each point uh, based on all the other points because gravity. If we have 1,000 points, that's going to be 1,000 on the order of 1,000 squared. Uh, that's going to be a lot of points to calculate, a lot of pairs to be calculating the gravitational force for. And in general, if we have n points, that's going to be O n squared uh, calculations per frame. And you can imagine if we have 1,000 points, that's going to be a million calculations per frame, which is going to be way too much. So we need a faster algorithm for determining the gravitational force or simulating the gravity between n different points. This is called the n-body problem, by the way. So there's a whole Wikipedia article on it. It's really long. Uh, we could go into a lot more depth about this, uh, probably use some differential equations or whatever and big maths, uh, but we're just going to be doing this computationally, not using like math or anything. Uh, just algorithms and brute force is all we're gonna need. So you can imagine if we use this naive algorithm and I'm just gonna swap that out right now. If we run this with a naive algorithm, just calculating all pairs of points and doing gravitational force between them, that's going to be quite slow. So let's let's add a few points. 100 points, 200 points, it's all running fine so far. Uh, but let, let's say we get to 1,000 points. Getting to 1,000 points, it slows down to about 20 frames per second. So you can see there's a considerable amount of lag right here. Uh, whereas if we use the fast algorithm, which I'll be describing in just a second, running 1,000 points, no problem. We're staying at about 60 frames a second. Okay, that's a bit lower, but you know, give us some slack. It's it's at least not 20 frames per second. It's, it's decently smooth. I mean, you know, we can still make stuff explode, uh, which, which looks cool. Anyway, so what's the faster algorithm called? It is called the Barnes-Hutt algorithm. All of what I'm about to say is basically contained in this article right here. It's a fabulous article, beautifully formatted, has uh, great pictures and very readable. I'm going to link to it in the description below. I learned about the algorithm through this article, uh, implemented it using it as a reference. So great article. Uh, thanks to these authors. 
So the most important part of the algorithm is that it's an approximation. So we're not going to be finding the exact gravitational force and simulating it completely accurately, but we're going to have a pretty good approximation of it. So we're sacrificing accuracy for speed, which may be relatable in a lot of other fields. So let's say we have some points and we're going to be working with a, a square region here. So let's, let's just copy that. Yeah, let's say we have some points right here. Uh, you can see they're divided into a weird sort of grid. Now how, what this grid is called is a quad tree. Quad because every region in space um, is a square, at least how we're doing it. Um, and then every square can be split up into four smaller squares, which are its quadrants. So you can imagine if we have the big square, that's going to be a node in our tree. And then if we split it up into four quadrants, that's going to generate four children for that node. So every node represents a region in space and children represent its four divisions, its four quadrants as divisions of it. Um, how this tree is generated is such that every quadrant contains exactly one node. So uh, this just makes grouping things together a lot easier. Quad trees, by the way, are not just used for the Barnes Hut algorithm. They're used for a variety of other things, uh, one of which is collision detection, uh, which I will actually talk a bit about later on. So our first task is constructing the quad tree. How do we construct it? Well, first we need a, we, we need a root node, right? This is going to be the big square uh, to determine the bounding square actually of all our points. That's a different algorithm, but it's pretty simple. You just get the min X, the max X, the min Y, the max Y, do some math on them. And then you got a bounding square. So we have our node. We're just going to find that real easily. As long as there are more than two points in there, or at least two points in there, we're going to split up our region. So how do we actually build the tree from that step onwards? We're going to go node by node and insert each node into the tree as appropriate. So starting out, we have node A. Node A looks like it's fine. It only has, uh, its parents only has A as its child. It's going to be contained within the root. Great, okay. Now we have B, um, and this is a problem. When we look in the tree, B wants to be in the same node as A, which is not allowed. So we're going to have to split up this root node into four children. And then we're going to have to relocate A to its appropriate spot. So splitting into four children visually looks like this. A is going to get reinserted into a new child. B is going to get reinserted into a new child. There are different quadrants. Now we're happy. Um, and now we have C. So C goes in through the root. Uh, the root has children, so we're going to go down a level. C wants to be in the second quadrant over here. I'm numbering it as one, two, three, uh, four, by the way. So C wants to go into the same node as B, which is not allowed. So we're going to split B or the node that contained B further into quadrants uh, and B is going to get relocated. So temporarily it's not gonna exist. Uh, it's not gonna be in the tree. Uh, but B and C are still in the same node. They, they both want to be in this node right here. So that's not allowed. We're going to have to split further, split this top left one further. Okay, now we're in a good place because B and C want to be in different quadrants. B wants to be here and C wants to be here. So now we're good. We can replace B and C into their new spots. And it goes on like this. D gets inserted. D gets inserted into this, this node right here. E gets inserted into whatever node. We continue splitting um, and relocating nodes. So that every node contains either no bodies at all or exactly one body within it. Um, there are some details I'm missing here. For the Barnes algorithm, we are going to want to keep track of the center of mass for, of every node. So, for example, this node right here that contains both B and C, we want to keep track of its center of mass. That's going to be this node right here. Center of mass might be like at 5, 7 or something. Coordinates aren't important. We're also going to keep, want to keep track of its total mass. In our simulation, uh, we're only going to have 1 kilogram per object, so it really doesn't matter. Mass equals 2. Um, and center of mass, we're going to want to keep track of that as well. So when new nodes, uh, new bodies get inserted into certain nodes, we're going to have to propagate it up through all the uh, through all the parents. That's a bunch of details I'll go into in a potential future video if I ever explain how I made this. Something else I just brushed over was actually how we determine which quadrant a node goes into. And that's as simple as checking uh, whether it's past the midpoint of either X or Y and just doing conditional based on that. If we look at the code, this uh, this method right here, which 
Basically, given a point, it determines inside this node uh, which quadrant it should belong in. Okay, now that we've built our quad tree, we're going to need to run the algorithm on it. So the essential idea of this algorithm, other than the quad tree, is that if we have a body right here and we have a cluster of other bodies right here, if they're sufficiently far away, then we can approximate all these other bodies as one body. Because all these other bodies, the force they exert on A is going to be approximately the same. So doing them all individually will not uh, be super important. If we treat them as one object, that's going to be a close enough approximation of their total gravitational force on A. This only works, by the way, if the points are far enough away. If they're, if they're kind of close, then the different attractions to A might be really different. So we need some way of determining whether we should consider other points as being close enough that they can be clustered together and considered as one mass. So how we're going to do this is for every body, let's, let's use A as an example, we're going to eventually loop through all of them. Uh, we start at the root of the tree and we're going to traverse this entire tree um, using the usual depth for search or what have you. We use a condition to check if a node should be considered as far enough away to be grouped together. Uh, that is down here, uh, over here. We have side length divided by distance. So if the distance to a node's center of mass is sufficiently far from A, using a ratio of the side length of that node, uh, node's quadrants and the distance. In our case, we're going to be using a threshold of 0 0.7, which makes it run faster. I think they use 0 0.5 or something. I'm not sure. But you can see in this example, um, all of these nodes, all of these bodies in this node next to A are close enough to A that we should consider them separately. But in this example, in this node that contains B, C, and D, it's far enough away that we should group them together, consider it as one object. Now, this is where the keeping track of the center of mass and total mass of every node is important. So when we're grouping objects together as a single node, we need to know the total mass and center of mass to do the gravity calculation. And this is important to keep track of actually as we're doing it. We don't want to be computing this on the fly. That's going to be way too slow. Anyways, yeah. For the node A, we traverse through the entire tree, calculating all the gravitational forces on A by those other nodes, grouping together bodies if necessary. Phew, okay, that was that was a lot. I think that's all the important bits of the Barnes-Hutt algorithm. Um, the idea is we use a quad tree, we approximate several bodies as one body if they're far enough away, and yeah, that makes it a lot faster. Now let's do some time complexity analysis. Every frame, we're going to rebuild the tree. And you might think this is slow, there might be some faster way to do this, but no, we're going to rebuild the tree every frame because rebuilding only takes O and log N time. And the actual Barnes hut bit of calculating the gravitational force is also N log N because every point needs to go through the entire rest of the tree, um, but we're cutting it off at a certain depth because the distance is going to be uh, sort of held in check. So if we have a giant tree that goes down, uh, we're only going to search a, s a certain segment of the tree. Um, so yeah, we're going to rebuild the tree every frame and do calculations. It doesn't matter that we we're rebuilding because that time complexity is kind of sh overshadowed by the calculations. Uh, compared to the naive algorithm, O n squared, this is a lot better. So if we had 1,000 points, uh, O n log n is about 10,000. It should probably be log four, because every node has four children, so that would probably be 5,000. And then O n squared is going to be a million, which is really big. So you can see the giant performance uh, boost that using the Barnes Hutt algorithm can give us. Okay, now as promised, I'm going to talk a bit about collision. So you can see in this simulation, all of the bodies collide with each other. There are some glitchy effects with this. You can see they're, they're moving down for no apparent reason. And if I add several of them, it becomes a complete mess and kind of just explodes on itself for no reason at all. Quad trees make collisions nice. So if we have a quad tree, let's say we have points A and B over here. If we use a naive algorithm, that would be O n squared, which is far too slow. But using a quad tree, uh, if we know that A and B are in completely different quadrants, like really far apart, then we don't even have to consider them um, as collision candidate. So quad trees help with collision detection. And in fact, they make it O um, n log n. 
something very small. So we need to make sure that all the parts of our simulation are running at the same time complexity so that no one part slows it down uh, too much. So yeah, I didn't go into a whole lot of detail about collisions, but I do have a video on the physics of simulating a collision, which you can see over there, linked above. I go into detail about the physics using conservation of momentum and restitution, all that good stuff explaining how we actually simulate this. So I did use that exact algorithm that I explained in that video over here in the collisions file. And yeah, that's that's pretty much it for this video. Um, to make this beautiful gravity simulation, we use quad trees, Barnes huts. Yeah, which makes it really fast, really, which is the important part. If we were limited to an O n squared algorithm, we might have to do like a hundred particles or something, which is definitely not optimal. And I'm just rambling at this bit, but let's let's take a look at uh, some. Let's take a look at what would happen if there were no collisions. So this is like the OG gravity simulation. You just have clouds of particles. This is what it looks like. It looks pretty cool, in my opinion looks a lot more natural, perhaps not that hexagonal lattice stuff. But yeah, using Barnes Hut at 2000 particles, it's running at roughly 20 frames per second, which is not optimal, definitely, but you know, it's faster than if it were Owen squared. So yeah, that's pretty much it for this video. I explained all the good stuff with gravity simulation. If you want to see my code, let me know in the comments below and I might post it in the description. This article will definitely be in the description though. It's just a great article. Um, so I want to give credit to the authors over here. And if you would like a future video explaining all the nitty gritty details and all the code here, also let me know in the comments. That's going to be a bigger project, but I think it might be very helpful, um, especially if you want to follow along. So thanks for watching all the way to the end and bye-bye.